last months of 1940, the close of a dramatic year in which the pulse of history beat at an ever faster rate. A new type of war burst upon the world as France reeled beneath the blitzkrieg of the German army. France was to crumble to defeat and political collapse in barely a month. A proud, great power descending into a hell of occupation, betrayal and collaboration. As German soldiers marched in Paris and as the Vichy government of Pétain accommodated the Nazis, Charles de Gaulle rallied the free French in exile to carry on resistance. The Battle of Britain has been fought in the skies of England, with Hitler's proud Luftwaffe meeting its first reversal of fortune. The Blitz has begun bringing death and destruction on the cities of the United Kingdom. All Britain can do is resist and defy. Amidst the destruction of all they know, the people of Britain refuse to be cowed. Abandoning his plans for invasion, Hitler seeks to weary Britain with an incessant grinding bombing and to drive Britain to despair by widening the war, surrounding her with ever more enemies. His Italian allies invade the British protectorate of Egypt and bring the war into the Balkans with attacks on Greece. The Greek nation, in bold defiance, resists the invasion and turns the tables upon the Italians in a series of thrusting counterattacks. In America, Franklin Roosevelt wins a third term, promising to keep America from the war. In the coming months, as the war grows even larger, it'll be even harder for the United States to remain apart from the turmoil which tears apart the globe. As 1940 drew to a close, the war was spreading ever wider. In southern Europe, Italy had invaded Greece. The motives behind this invasion were the usual desire for a new Roman Empire and the aggrandizement of Mussolini's fascist state. The battle was fought in the winter of the fierce northern mountains of Epirus. Italy had presented itself as a modern fascist state. Mussolini was proud to review what appeared the army of the future with fleets of tanks and armadas of aircraft. That strength was an illusion. Italy had neither the wealth nor the industrial infrastructure to create true strength. Time and time again, the Italian armies would prove by far the weaker half of the Axis partnership, inadequate to deliver the boasts and promises of the Italian leadership. Greece was not a powerful enemy, poor, backward, and politically unstable. Although itself ruled by a dictatorship with extreme right-wing politics, Greece was nonetheless pro-British and in alliance with Britain and France from April 1939. Presented with Italian demands and threats, the Greek dictator Metaxas, though unpopular, caught the spirit of the Greek people with one word rejection, Aki, no a rebuff that provoked invasion. The invasion by the Italians descended into farce. The invaders were quickly driven back. In just days, the Greek army was pushing into Albania and occupying a large area of formerly Italian territory. With the arrival of winter, the two armies settled into inactivity. But the stage was set for the Balkans to become a dramatic arena of war. Germany's attention was still distracted by Britain and her empire, still a difficult thorn in the side of Hitler, a potential threat. Hitler's planned strategy of invading the British Isles had crashed with the planes of the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain. The invasion was cancelled, the invasion fleet dispersed. The new strategy aimed to defeat Britain via the Blitz, massive heavy bomber attacks against the civilian and industrial targets of the UK. Waves of bombers would strike at night with high explosives and incendiary firebombs. The incendiary attacks were particularly devastating. Aircraft could shower thousands of small bombs, swamping and overwhelming fire services. The fires started becoming beacons to guide following waves of attacks through the darkened blackout. The German plan was to weary the British people, make them tire of the war. 
nighttime attacks were essential to preserve the planes of the German Air Force after the heavy losses of the Battle of Britain. Each morning, the people of Britain would awake to discover who had been killed and who had lost their homes the previous night. In late 1940, the weight of German attacks was switched from London to the provincial cities of the UK. In the wider framework of history, the weight of bombs falling on the UK cities was not great. Later in the war, a higher tonnage of explosives would fall in single nights on single German cities than was used against London in the whole war. The strategy of bombing Britain was just part of Hitler's plan to break British will. The Nazis also sought to stretch Britain to surrender by applying pressure on many fronts, from many directions. One of these extra pressure points was North Africa, where Hitler's ally, Italy, was attacking the British forces guarding the strategically important Suez Canal. As with Mussolini's Greek tragedy, the fascist forces could not deliver the promises and arrogance of the Italian dictator. The huge armies that Italy had thrown against the British had advanced but a small way into Egypt and then halted at a place called Sidi Barani to cautiously and timidly await supplies and reinforcements. Early in November, the British Army of the Nile had mounted a massive counterattack even though vastly outnumbered by the Italians. 300,000 men compared to the British 50,000. The British Army was an army of the British Empire, a force that included Indian troops fighting far from home, New Zealanders from the other side of the world. In the skies, above the desert, flew South Africans and many other citizens of the empire. The British swept forward over vast distances with powerful tank forces. In the next two months, the British destroyed a total of nine Italian divisions, captured 138,000 Italian prisoners, destroying and taking hundreds of tanks and guns. To a Britain that had been bombarded physically by air assault, bombarded emotionally by news of British troops in seeming constant retreat, the ranks of captured Italians, their dejected columns stretching for miles under the orders of British soldiers, was a glad sight. The vast spaces of the desert made for dramatic warfare. A war of movement with open fields of fire and action unimpeded by town, natural barrier or civilian population. Throughout the fighting in the desert, for all combatants, it was the ability to maintain their lines of supply, not to outrun the lifeblood of fuel, food and ammunition, that became essential to the success of any advance and the avoidance of defeat. It was because of poor supply that the Italians had halted to await a British attack. It was logistics that caused the British to eventually, in the first month of 1941, bring their advance to a halt. The British consolidated. They had captured towns and ports to hold and garrison. The war in the Mediterranean was spreading and the British offensive in North Africa was halted for strength to be drawn off to fight other battles against more threatening enemies, to defend more precarious positions. As the British people struggled through rubble of their towns and cities, time and time again it was to be repeated that the British can take it. The British reply to the German strategy was one of simple resistance and endurance. November 15th saw one of the most notorious and unforgotten raids of this time when the Luftwaffe destroyed the English Midlands city of Coventry. The city's medieval cathedral was reduced to rubble and many factories making munitions, engines to power tanks and aircraft and other war supplies were all destroyed. 60,000 of the city's 75,000 buildings were badly damaged in some way. 450 German aircraft made the attack. Only 120 sorties were flown in opposition, 
and the city had only 40 anti-aircraft guns. Only one German plane was lost. Much history has been devoted to the value of air power in the Second World War. Whether indiscriminate attacks on centers of population were of value, whether or not they were moral. The attack on Coventry showed that a coordinated focused attack on a relatively small target could be dramatically successful. This was no mass arbitrary terror raid, but one coordinated with radar guidance by the Germans. Specialist Pathfinder squadrons came first, designating the target with highly accurate incendiary attacks that started fires to guide the following plans. A terrible truth is that it was known the raid was coming, but no preparation could be made. The raid was discovered by the reading of the messages transmitted by Germans in the highly secret Enigma machine, code broken by the British Ultra system. The agonizing decision that had to be made was when and when not to use this intelligence. The use of this most secret intelligence was never discovered. The Nazis never believed their deepest secrets could be read, never realizing Enigma was a broken weapon. To use everything would be to ultimately compromise the secret of Ultra. To preserve the source meant sacrificing British and Allied lives. Coventry became a stepping stone in the escalation of the inhumanity and savagery of war. The RAF would revenge Coventry. Britain had no means of striking back at Hitler. The Germans held the strategic initiative, and every move would be of Hitler's choice. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill knew that the only path that led to British victory, rather than simple survival, was involving the United States. And all British diplomacy was to this end. President Franklin Roosevelt had resolutely attempted to keep the United States neutral. Though Roosevelt had won the 1940 election on the promise that his country would not go to war, the American president realized that the gap between the Axis and America was widening, that a world dominated by the fascist powers was not a world to which America belonged. In a broadcast to the American people at the close of 1940, Roosevelt declared his belief that America had to play a part in the war, that the United States should become the arsenal of democracy. There is less chance of the United States getting into the war if we do all we can to support the nations defending themselves than if we acquiesce in their defeat. And that the United States should support all those who struggle to preserve the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom from fear. As Britain and America moved closer together, Hitler's ally Mussolini was proving more and more of a weakness than a strength. The fighting in Greece had proven disastrously humiliating with the Italian invasion thrown back in retreat. Catastrophe loomed in North Africa, threatening the loss of the entire Italian North African colony of Tripoli. The failures of the Italian armies in these campaigns were to be key events in the war. The list of Italian defeats went on and on. On January 4, 1941, the fall of the Libyan fortress and port of Bardia brought the surrender of 45,000. January 13th, the streets of Athens were filled with rejoicing crowds as over a thousand Italian elite troops surrendered. In Africa, a remote backwater of the war, a British army from Kenya invaded Italian Somaliland and threw the Italian forces into retreat. On January 22nd in North Africa, when Australian troops took the vital supply port of Tobruk, it was for the Italians as if Dunkirk had fallen. Everywhere, 
the new empire of Rome was crumbling away. The long catalogue of Italian failures led to a cry for help within the Axis alliance. As Italian soldiers were queuing to surrender to the British and Greek forces, Mussolini was meeting Hitler. The surrenders and the defeats humiliated Mussolini, whose regime and fascist movement was older than Hitler's Nazi Germany. Mussolini regarded himself as the senior partner in the Axis and was now forced to ask for help. Hitler agreed to use German forces to rescue the Italians. His price was Mussolini's acceptance of German direction of the war. The dragging of the German forces southwards to the Mediterranean, to the Balkans, into North Africa, was to skew German thinking sapped the strength of the German war effort in ways that time and time again throughout the history of the war would be to the detriment of Nazi aims. The German move southwards brought a storm of war to Malta as the British held island came under ferocious air attack from the German Luftwaffe. The attacks on Malta were an obvious move given its strategic position in the central Mediterranean. Malta's huge, deep, safe, natural harbors made it an obvious naval base from which whatever power held the island could threaten a Mediterranean enemy with control of strategic sea routes east to west, north to south. The island was a threatening base for air forces. Britain had controlled the island for over a hundred years and saw their colony as central to their Mediterranean strategy. It was a fortress with several airfields and a huge naval dockyard and was an outpost in every sense. Only 95 kilometers from Italy, yet 1600 kilometers from the nearest British base. The Axis Alliance sought to destroy Malta from the air. That they never succeeded in neutralizing the island proved fatal to their strategy. Malta had been attacked from the very start of the war with Italian aircraft, for a time defended by just three obsolete biplanes. When the war spread to North Africa, the Luftwaffe arrived in Italy to assist the fighting. From January 1, 1941, air raids began. For the next seven months, there was to be just one 24-hour period in which no air raid was made. Twice as many bombs as fell on London during the Blitz were hurled upon Malta in just two months. The aim was to starve the island into submission. Incessant raids drove the island's civilian population of over a quarter of a million to live underground. A blockade by Axis air forces prevented Britain sending convoys of ships with supplies of war. The siege was to last for two and a half years. Malta had been captured for Britain by the Navy of Lord Nelson. Late 1940 saw a classic naval action in that Nelsonian tradition. A daring attack was made against the Italian fleet as it lay at anchor in the southern Italian port of Taranto. The Italian Admiralty had tried to avoid action, fearing to risk their great ships. The British tradition of seeking battle at sea, to go right at them, was continued as three fascist battleships were destroyed and the dockyards severely damaged. Torpedo bombers made the attack from an aircraft carrier that had approached stealthily, in secret. Taranto was a lesson in tactics observed in Japan. The war in the western desert of North Africa was to be a war of dramatic seesaws of fortune. In 1941, in February, the Italian appeal for German help in their desert campaign was met with the creation of a legend. German forces, small compared to the number of men involved elsewhere in the war, were landed in North Africa. This was the Africa Corps, the commander, Erwin Rommel. The guiding thinking that led Rommel's Africa Corps was mobility, always to maintain movement until the moment was right for attack. In southern Europe, other events were taking place that would give Rommel his chance. On April 6th, Britain landed troops in Greece. At the same time, Germany's aid to Italy arrived in the Balkans, 
Panzer armies 24 divisions strong, some of Germany's best and most mobile troops were moved into Germany's ally Bulgaria, ready to strike. On April 6th, those troops burst in a simultaneous blitzkrieg upon both Greece and Yugoslavia. The war was to be remarkable by the speed with which countries were to collapse before blitzkrieg onslaught. Yugoslavia was just another country in the way of German strategic goals, a role that the German armies had to take to achieve their objectives. Yugoslavia fell in nine days. Its army of over a million descended into chaos. Yugoslavia's factions and ethnic hatred surfaced as the Croatian and Muslim units in its multi-ethnic army mutinied and went over to the Nazis. The Germans lost just 151 dead as they simply marched through the country to attack Greece. The lack of Yugoslav resistance meant that the combined British and Greek armies were completely outflanked, outnumbered, outgunned, and overwhelmed. Less than three weeks after arriving in Greece, the decision was taken to evacuate the Greek mainland. A long fighting retreat began as British, Australian and New Zealand soldiers began a withdrawal, heading south towards yet another Dunkirk. Once again, the Navy rescued the soldiers. 50,000 were saved. Greece was added to the long list of countries over which Axis domination was spread. Churchill was to say that he believed the decision to fight in Greece to be the only mistake that his government had ever made. The crucial error in Britain's deciding to fight in Greece was that the campaign stripped strength and forces from other theaters of war, most notably the western desert of North Africa. As the Battle of Greece was barely beginning, in the Western Desert, the dramatic advances which had yielded such huge gains of territory and vast numbers of prisoners were about to be reversed. Within days of arrival, the Africa Corps burst onto the war, smashing through weak screening forces and thrusting deep to the rear of the British lines. The speed of the advance, such that the British commanding general, Richard O'Connor, was overtaken and captured as prisoner of war. The German advances terrified even the German High Command, who described Africa Corps Commander Rommel as stark mad, advising him to consolidate his victories, to dig in. The response by the British was panic. Churchill threw resources at the situation, tanks and troops to mount a counterattack. Rommel and the Africa Corps were as able in defense as they were in attack the British attacks were driven back. The British forces reeled backwards and both armies paused, awaiting the next blow from the Germans. British panic as the offensive turned to defeat brought the first of a series of desperate changes of command as Churchill sacked General Wavell, his commander in the Middle East. In the coming year, British general after British general were to pit their wits against Rommel. On the other side of the world, events were taking place that were to have a dramatic and devastating effect on the war, on the whole course of Chinese history. China had been the scene of a protracted war since the 1930s. Indeed, some historians hold that World War II really started in 1937, as China struggled to resist the forces of the Empire of Japan. Japan wished to absorb China within the greater Asia co-prosperity sphere. Masquerading as an alliance against European colonial exploitation, the co-prosperity sphere was, in reality, a mechanism by which the resources of Asia were exploited by Japan. It was a war with its own justification, a war to gain the resources that were needed to fight the war. In China, the Japanese fought an alliance between the Kuomintang, the nationalists, led by the military strongman Chiang Kai-shek, and communist forces led by Mao Zedong. The anti-Japanese alliance was always built on shaky foundations, 
before the Japanese invasion, the two factions had fought for control of China. Already in January 1940, the cracks were appearing in this alliance, which warned of future conflict. The communists were developing a new way of war in fighting the Japanese, the theory of revolutionary guerrilla war. The war of fighting was corresponded by a war of words, of politics and diplomacy. In the early part of February 1941, Japan issued ominous threats. The expansion of Japan into the territory of its neighbors was always cloaked in the morality of anti-imperialism. On February 24th, the Japanese foreign minister, Tosui Matsuka, said that Japan has a natural right to the Western Pacific and Australia. The white races must cede this area to the Asiatics. We have a natural right to migrate there. In the war of words, Winston Churchill once more used his weapon of choice in a passionate appeal to the United States. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long drawn trials of vigilance or exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. Already the United States was supplying some of these tools. Under a policy called cash and carry, U.S. weapons bought in the U.S. and carried in U.K. ships were held not to violate U.S. neutrality. And the agreement to exchange destroyers for bases was easing the position in the battle for the Atlantic. In March 1941, U.S. support moved to new levels. Roosevelt signed into law the Lend-Lease Bill. Lend-Lease enabled the president to send weapons, munitions, aircraft, machinery and designs to any country whose defense he felt essential to the well-being of the United States. Essentially, the bill gave Britain a blank checkbook to fight the war with American industrial wealth. At the same time, America stopped supplies to Germany of the strategic materials of the specialist resources needed for weapon systems. That the isolationist sentiment of the American Congress was overcome was a sign that American government and people were starting to realize that they had to support the democracies of the world, that the collapse of the British Empire would mean global chaos. Lend-Lease enabled President Roosevelt to make good use of his pledge for America to become the arsenal of democracy. At the same time as the U.S. was supplying the stuff of war, Britain was further mobilizing and using its store of human talent to the full. The mobilization of women was essential to the British war effort, and the British government used its powers to conscript women into industry. Women were drafted into all areas of industry and transport, into previously exclusively male preserves. Jobs previously classified as mysterious male crafts were suddenly de-skilled, and women took the places of men taken into the armed forces. It was an area where Nazi ideology was weak. The Nazis believed women only good for the breeding of children and caring of the home. This tunnel vision was to be a failing in the mobilization of industry. The spring of 1941 once more saw the resumption of heavy air attacks against Britain's cities, continuing the policy of terror against the British population. Once again, this psychological attack upon the will of the British people was spun into reverse by the British media, as both Buckingham Palace, the home of the British royal family, and the Houses of Parliament were hit. Cinema newsreels used the news to further reinforce the sense of coherent solidarity in the British population. People and government were all in this together and determined to tough it out. In a secret war directive, Hitler was to admit the failure of his plan to cow Britain with aerial terrorism. The bombing campaign has had least effect of all, he said. As far as we all can see on the morale and the will to resist of the English people, 
no decisive results can be expected from terror attacks on residential areas. Bombing is to be intensified on shipping and the ports to inflict the greatest possible damage on the British economy and to give the impression that an invasion is planned for this year. In all wars, the secret decision to act, the secret intention, the secret weapon gives advantage. In spring of 1941, Britain used a secret weapon to win a dramatic victory at sea against the Italians. In the Battle of Matapan, the Royal Navy lured a force of Italian warships to destruction off the southern coast of Greece. That victory was made possible by the use of secret intelligence, by the Ultra system that had managed to break the most secret German codes. If the battle was maneuvered by state-of-the-art technology, it was a victory won by traditional naval strengths, speed and accuracy of firing, by superior seamanship, by the aggression and courage of the crews. one of the strangest episodes in the story of the war occurred. Adolf Hitler's deputy Fuhrer, Rudolf Hess, parachuted into Scotland alone. Hess claimed his astrologer had told him that he, Rudolf Hess, was personally destined to be the bringer of peace between Britain and Germany. Hess claimed that in return for a free hand in Europe, Britain would be allowed to retain her empire. The offer was rejected and Hess was to spend the rest of his life in captivity. Amidst all the fighting on the land, the new diversion of aerial battles and the struggle of small ships against the submarine, it was still the Royal Navy at sea as battle fleet, a line of mighty ships sailing in line astern that was taken as the symbol of Britain's armed might. In the British fleet at sea was seen an icon of British strength, of the domination of a worldwide empire, of British virtues and character. The fleet at sea, a battle fleet of heavy gun ships, was in a direct historical tradition that linked the Navy in a continuous line to the fleets of history and other finest hours. If one ship was to be taken as a symbol of the Navy, it was HMS Hood named after an admiral of the golden age of the 18th century navy. Hood was the largest ship of her type in the world, fast and powerful. In May 1940, Hood was ordered to engage the German battleship Bismarck. Bismarck was the Hood's opposite number in the German navy, the largest and the most powerful. Bismarck had put to sea to act as a surface raider against the Atlantic merchant ships. Few vessels could outrun her. No escorts of destroyers or light cruisers could match her firepower. She had to be met by an opposite number of equal weight. Hood had been laid down in World War I and put to sea in 1920. The engagement with Bismarck was Hood's first and only battle. In the space of just a few minutes, the Hood was destroyed with the loss of all but three of her crew. Hood and Bismarck were, of course, effectively obsolete. The future of war at sea lay in the combination of naval strength with air power, the aircraft carrier. Bismarck was chased by over 100 British ships. It was torpedo attacked by bombers from an aircraft carrier, making her impossible to steer. Bismarck was to circle helplessly and could not maneuver to resist the combined strength of British ships closing in and met her end. Coming so soon after the loss of Hood, Britain rejoiced. Having driven British, Greek and Empire forces out of mainland Greece, there remained in late spring of 1941 one remaining obstacle to the securing of Hitler's southern flank. This was the Greek island of Crete, which, if in allied hands, 
could have been made a fortress that could menace the Axis. On May 22nd, the Germans attacked the island in an assault that was to be unique in military history. Crete was to be the only campaign that was begun and fought to conclusion using airborne forces alone. On May 22nd, the skies of Crete filled with paratroopers. In 1941, the paratrooper was seen as the soldier of the future, with a way of fighting that combined the modern technology of fight with an act of courage and daring that seemed to require extra special human qualities. Paratroopers in all armies thought themselves the elite, with distinctive uniforms and a high esprit de corps. In an age when radar was new and unsophisticated, aircraft could still spring surprises, and throughout World War II, parachute drops had dramatically seized fortresses, surrounded slow-moving formations, caused panic and fear in civilian and soldier alike. In an age when the ordinary infantryman was armed with a simple rifle, the long period when the paratrooper dangled helpless in the sky as a slow-moving and clear target was not so great a weakness. The German Parachute Division, part of the German Air Force, with its attached glider troops and airborne regiments, each with their own transport, had a triumphant war, carving their own place in history. In campaign after campaign, winning stunning victories without reverses. The German plan for the invasion of Crete was a bold, logical conclusion of these successes. Once secured, the plan was to use Crete as a base from which to attack Cyprus, and in the same way from Cyprus to attack Lebanon and Palestine, and threaten Britain's Middle Eastern oil and the Suez Canal. Meeting with the Africa Corps, attacking from the west in a grand pincer action. Parachute and glider forces were to seize Cretan airfields, which would then be used to fly in transport planes with reinforcements to secure the victory. Only when the victory was won would the seaborne troops arrive. The British Prime Minister Churchill had his own plans for Crete. He had ordered the island made into a fortress, in which troops were to be dug in in impregnable positions. Churchill thought that the Germans would attack the island and be defeated in a battle that would turn the tide in the Balkans. The large garrison that was to fight the Germans was a hodgepodge farrago of different units, of hastily organized and improvised formations, of logistics troops given rifles, of whole regiments fleeing the Greek mainland that arrived with no boots. The German attack on the first day was disastrous, paratroopers dropping in many cases directly on top of the British positions. In a bitter battle lasting barely a week, the victory Churchill imagined very nearly came. But in the end, the German strength grew. And once more, the Navy was called upon to arrange the escape of an army. The bedraggled troops threaded their way over the mountains of Crete to escape. However, German losses in Crete were so high that the parachute forces were never again used as an independent force. Behind all the events of the war, as it spread to every country, town and village of Europe, behind all the images of chaos, of mass destruction, of desolate surrender and desperate hard-fought victory, underlying the fighting on land, sea and air, there was a plan. There was a grand strategy that looked into a larger history, to a destiny. From the very beginning of Nazism, from its earliest days, Hitler's philosophy of National Socialism was a theory of history that explained the past and predicted the future. Hitler saw National Socialism's destiny as confronting and destroying Soviet Communism in the East. It was a fight to gain living space for the superior German race at the expense of the inferior Slavic people of Russia. Hitler believed this titanic confrontation essential for the future of the world and something about which there could be no compromise, an inevitable certainty. In 1939, the world had stood in shock at the Nazi-Soviet pact, an alliance of two ideologies previously in direct and deadly opposition. 
For Hitler, the pact gave him the freedom to destroy Poland, the freedom to fight in the West with not a threat of war on two fronts. For Stalin, the pact brought the illusion of security. In Hitler's grand scheme and stratagem, the pact was a sham to buy time. All events of the war from 1939 were part of the bigger grand plan to invade and destroy Russia. Each campaign shaped and shaded by this goal which lay beneath every Nazi move. The cancellation of the invasion of Britain was due to a shifting of Hitler's gaze eastwards. The story of the war in 1941 is the story of successive distraction and diversion from Hitler's great plan. All through 1941, Germany was assembling a massive force along the borders of Soviet Russia. The shifting focus of effort meant that pressure slackened on all other fronts, as planes, guns, tanks, men, and above all, Hitler's will was turned to the east. As Stalin reviewed his armed forces, he believed his country was safe. The Soviet forces looked immense and strong with the largest number of tanks in the world, outnumbering the potential enemy. The Soviets believed the Nazi-Soviet pact would hold, that Hitler would keep his word. Stalin's pre-war show trials and purges, his paranoia which caused him to eliminate anyone he thought dissident, had caused the death of many good officers and filled the ranks with men afraid to show independence and initiative. The Russian forces were filled with political commissars placed to ensure the reliability and loyalty of the troops to communism. Stalin was obsessed with territory and deployed his vast resources to ensure that no areas gained in his grab of Poland would be lost. Against all military sense, his armies were deployed along his western border, defending every turn and twist of the line on the map with no consideration for natural defensive positions of terrain or of defense in depth. In June 1941, it was clear that the war was coming. Russia was warned by British intelligence that German forces were being transferred east, that 3.6 million German soldiers, 3,350 tanks and 2,000 aircraft were massed upon the German-Russian frontier. Stalin refused to believe an attack was close, even when a defector revealed the exact date and start time, June 22, at 4 a.m. On that day, the largest force of war ever assembled in the history of the world moved. Hitler called his plan Operation Barbarossa, after the medieval German emperor who led German armies to the east centuries before. Barbarossa consisted of three attacks, each followed a historical invasion route. In the north, a thrust was made along the coast towards Leningrad, modern-day St. Petersburg. In the center, the most powerful attack was aimed at the Russian capital and the encirclement and destruction of vast numbers of Russian troops. The third southern thrust was a stab at the Ukraine the heart of the Soviet Union's agricultural, industrial, mining and oil producing area in southern Russia. The attacks were to the classic blitzkrieg formula of heavy air bombardment with powerful deep attacks by tanks and motorized infantry, encircling the enemy, who could then be destroyed by slower moving infantry. Apart from marshes to the central area of the frontier, no natural barrier lay in the path of the Germans and their goals. The vast space of Russia offered terrain ideal for armored warfare. In autumn and spring, heavy rains turned the mostly dirt roads to mud. However, in the dry heat of the Russian summer, the vehicles rolled forward easily and quickly. It's hard to conceive of the massive numbers involved in the Eastern fighting. Mass surrenders and defeats on a scale never before seen. Many hundreds of thousands of men were captured. The Soviet army began Barbarossa with a strength of 2,600,000. In the first months of the campaign, its strength fell to 800,000. 
Moreover, the battles were fought with a ruthless brutality probably unknown in Europe since Christian armies defended the continent from Muslim Ottoman Turks. Encircled, surrounded Russians fought with a tenacious despair that even the most stubborn and determined French soldiers had not shown. The Germans showing ferocious lack of pity that no Western soldier had yet to face. The soldiers of Germany took their lead from Hitler, who on March 30th said, The war against Russia will be such that it cannot be conducted in nightly fashions. The struggle is one of ideology and racial difference, and will have to be conducted with unprecedented, unmerciful and unrelenting harshness. All officers will have to rid themselves of obsolete ideologies. I know that the necessity for such means of making war is beyond the comprehension of generals, but I insist that my orders be executed without contradiction. The commissars are bearers of ideology directly opposed to national socialism. Therefore, the commissars will be liquidated. German soldiers guilty of breaking international law will be excused. Russia has not participated in the Hague Convention and therefore has no rights under it. German soldiers, many of whom had grown up under Nazi rule, identified with Hitler's words and were callous instruments of his will. Russian troops of all ranks and classes were treated with disregard. The communist commissars, the political officers, were shot out of hand. A total of 5,700,000 Russians were captured by the Germans in the whole of the war. 3,300,000 were to die in captivity. Yet, in the Russian mind, fear of the enemy was outweighed by fear of Stalin. Generals who failed were shot as traitors by the Russian secret police. Rather than save their forces by tactical retreat, Russian generals would rather await surrender and annihilation. The success of Barbarossa seemed the fulfillment of the Nazi destiny and the end of Soviet communism, a vindication of the Nazi ideology. Those who do not understand history are condemned to repeat it. The German armies followed in the footprints of the French army of 1812, which had perished in the snow of the Russian winter. Barbarossa began in late June, when already some of the better, finer weather of the Russian summer had gone, and the countdown to the deep Russian cold begun. The deep, deep cold that was as ferocious an enemy of the invader as any army. Historians will forever debate whether the wars in the south of Europe delayed the start of Barbarossa, leaving too little time before the end of summer. Barbarossa was Hitler's vision, his dream. In the twists and turns of the timeline of events, of possibilities, ifs and maybes, it's fascinating to contemplate an alternative course of history. As Hitler's 153 divisions of nearly 4 million men forged eastwards, in North Africa, Rommel's Africa Corps prepared to mount an invasion of Egypt, but with a fraction of the vast numbers in Russia. Had but a small share of these troops been given to Rommel, his strength would have overwhelmed the British, and his victory would have probably forced Britain to make peace. The implications of what might have been are frightening to contemplate. But in September 1941, the Nazis had no thought for any other future, any other than that which led into the vast spaces of the East. In September, Hitler's army marched ever eastward with triumph and certainty. A month later, the first snows of winter were to fall. Next time on World War II, The Complete History, the terrible drama of Barbarossa unfolds with the German armies at the gates of Moscow. Stalin orders the destruction of the very fabric of the Soviet Union before the advancing Germans, and the Russian winter throws its icy grip round the armies of the Third Reich. As America marches on the path to war, an old soldier, Douglas MacArthur, is recalled to the service of his country. 
Britain and America move closer to alliance as the U.S. Navy begins to take active involvement in fighting German U-boats in the North Atlantic. In the constant fencing of diplomacy around the war, the war of words that went hand in hand with the fighting, Stalin urges his Western allies to start a second front. In the Far East, Japan continues its ever more belligerent attacks upon the European powers in Asia. In a last desperate move to preserve peace, U.S. President Roosevelt appeals directly to Japanese Emperor Hirohito. While politicians talk peace, the fleet of the Japanese Empire secretly approaches the Hawaiian Islands and the U.S. base of Pearl Harbor. Its aim, to knock the U.S. Navy out of the Pacific War. The strain breaks, and on what Roosevelt is to call the Day of Infamy, as the U.S. fleet lies at anchor, the planes of the Japanese Navy burst out of a morning sky to rain death and destruction. Sane minds in Japan already know it is a desperate gamble for the Japanese Empire, that a war must be won quickly or lost to the industrial might of America. On the same day, Germany declares war upon the United States, and the fates of both Nazi and Japanese empires are sealed.